start off. Have you ever judged anyone before? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, John Meyer in the back row. <laughs> <laughs> this is all about you this morning. <laughs> <laughs> or perhaps have you passed judgment on someone? What lenses or criteria do you use to evaluate or critique? I remember learning very on, and I've repeated it many times when you start to point a finger and three are pointing right back at you. So watch out what you're judging on. This past week, being identified as a Bible scholar, I was asked about my take on Judgment Day. <laughs> Knowing that this was a deep hole that I could immediately step into, and suspecting that there was more behind the question than what was being asked, I responded a little bit lengthier than I do now. The starting place for all judgment is God's judgment in Scripture. In the beginning, God created all things. All things. Good. Yes. There. Oh, we're going to have to have Bible lesson 101. In the beginning, God created all things. Good. And that was God's judgment of creation. Then throughout the story of faith and time, humanity struggled and even departed from God and concern for others. Scripture talks about brokenness in and of relationship with God and others as sin. So oftentimes we want to start the story with sin and brokenness, but we can't forget that the story of faith, the story of God, begins with God's judgment of good and goodness. And then the story of God and humanity is one that constantly is seeking to restore what is right and good. For those who grew up in the Lutheran Church, maybe like you and I did, uh, the confession and forgiveness that began many of our worship services was from 1 John, in the first chapter, where the pastor began. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in the congregation, as many of us who were there, kind of knew this by memory and would swell. We are in bondage to sin and we cannot free ourselves. But God, who is faithful and just, forgives our sin and cleanses us from all unrighteousness with hopes that God would judge us as righteous. But because God desires to restore goodness in creation and in humanity, God came to live with us in Jesus. And simply put, God judges the world through the cross and the empty tomb. From death comes new life and freedom. And goodness, something of goodness is restored. So as Christians, we are called to and reminded that and given a vision of judgment that is God's and God's alone. Even if others don't know, believe or see God's goodness, we're given vision to see all things through the cross and through the empty tomb. And because much of our ideology of Judgment Day comes from the book of Revelation, John's vision and its interpretation can be summed up in a simple, yet robust and challenging phrase. God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. And because God has the first word and the last word, the first presence and the last presence, the first judgment and the last judgment, in all things, we can experience a measure of hope, a measure of peace, a measure and a flame of light through the light of Jesus Christ. God's judgment is for goodness and, or, and new or renewed life through creation, through the cross, through the empty tomb, and new creation. I say judgment, and judgment is God's alone, but I'm also reminded of Martin Luther's battle with depression and demons where he struggled with discerning which was the spirit of God and which was not. He was known to rely on 1 John in the fourth chapter, which speaks of discerning or judging between which is of the Spirit and that which is of not. That which is not. The heading in the Bible that I was looking
looking at and uh, preparing for this week says, testing the spirit. We must always be testing which spirit, by which spirit we are seeing things. And that we are entrusted with the gift of judgment between that which is fruitful and filling and of God, and that which is not. Sometimes we call this simply judging between good and evil. <clears throat> this week I pondered my explanation, this a little bit lengthy explanation of Judgment Day, as I've also considered the stories of Elijah and Peter that we heard a little bit earlier. Perhaps I'm alone in initially judging Elijah and Peter to some extent of being unfaithful, and that their fears and their worries get the better of them. Unlike me or anybody else I know. <laughs> and then I ask myself, what's the fruitfulness in that? God is joining and walking alongside these pillars of faith in the midst of their struggles. Why do I initially judge so harshly? And the answer that whispered into my thoughts was, why do you judge yourself so harshly? And as this weekend began, and as I started hearing the racial stories of hatred and violence happening in Charlottesville, Virginia this weekend, the theme of Christian faith and judgment swelled up again. Grappling with this, I came across many pastors who were also grappling, how do we talk about this today? Many online posts, many forums, many conversations over the past few days. How do we talk about and address with our people and worship that which we blatantly judge as evil, in which there is no good intent? And it's in my search and a conversation with a pastor in Southern California, Pastor Jenny Crean, that I became aware of the Spirit's breath again, and the truth that I shared with you many of her words this morning as I move into this section of how we understand God in the midst of Charlottesville. It's a well-known saying that among preachers that attributed to the theologian Karl Barth that the pastor should preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. <laughs> and it means that preaching can never be divorced from what's happening in the here and now. And if I got up here and gave a lecture on the Bible every week, that wouldn't be preaching. It probably wouldn't feed you much either. The point of preaching is to bring the word of God into our real lives to see what these ancient words of scripture have to say to us today. Preaching with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other is always a tricky balancing act. Now a lot of us don't get a physical newspaper anymore, but if I had a newspaper to hold up in one hand today, it would look like this picture. This weekend, Charlottesville, Virginia is a powder keg. We could trace the roots of this history and this story back to the Civil War or earlier. But the recent history is this. There is a statue of Robert E. Lee in the city park in Charlottesville, and a debate over removing the statue led to white nationalists planning a rally they dubbed Unite the Right. This weekend, protesters and counter-protesters have descended on Charlottesville. There was a call for a thousand clergy and faith leaders to come to Charlottesville in prayer and community, and many Lutheran pastors among them answered that call. There are at least two bishops, or were at least two bishops there this weekend as well. And for the pastors like myself, who aren't in Charlottesville, many of us had to scrap our planned sermons for this week and rewrite them yesterday. To preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper on the other hand means sometimes the headlines change the meaning or change the importance of what if God is calling us to think about and speak today. To ignore what is happening in Charlottesville is to stick with a comfortable message about keeping our eyes on Jesus which would be cowardly, and I owe you better than that. The fact of the matter is, here in the Skagit Valley, as well as many valleys and other places across the country, in this congregation and many others across the country, we are on a comfortable and safe shore, while fellow Christians and 
Virginia are caught in a storm. They are battered by the waves and the wind is against them. They fear for their lives. The next picture, Colvin, please. This photograph was taken by a Friday night showing a terrified child being comforted while white supremacists surrounded the church and prevented people inside from leaving. My colleagues that work in Charlottesville report that clergy were attacked by people wearing brass knuckles. We must speak the truth and name this for what it is. This, my brothers and sisters, is evil. It is evil to terrorize a child in a church. It is evil to march through the city carrying torches and chanting, chanting the Nazi slogan, blood and soil. And Jew will not replace us. Yes, this is what we have to contend with. The people who descended on Charlottesville for the Unite the Right rally are not political conservatives. They are not right-wing Republicans expressing their political views. They are white supremacists. They are neo-Nazis. They are displaying their hatred of difference and diversity with torches and Nazi salutes. <clears throat> they are so emboldened that they do not feel the need to wear hoods to hide their faces. This is evil. That's not a word I, nor many pastors, throw around lightly. But this is evil. If you want to know where to find God in Charlottesville this weekend, it's not among the white supremacists. God is with the people praying together and singing hymns. God is with a frightened child trapped inside a church. God is with those who fear for their safety. God is with those who cry out, Lord, save us. And when Jesus' disciples were caught in a storm, Jesus walked across the water to be with them. And he calmed the winds and the waves to protect them. When Elijah fled for fear of his life, God came to him in the silence, in a still, small voice. And one of our bishops of the Lutheran Church in Southwest California, Guy Irwin, put it beautifully. They have torches, but we have the light. The light of the world that has come into the world, and the darkness cannot overcome it. What? Can a preacher say in the face of these things? What can I say when evil is so clearly on display? When sin is marching boldly through the streets? I and many others can only proclaim that the God we worship, the Savior who we follow, is on the side of the oppressed. God is with the marginalized. God is with the fearful. God is with the victims. And in the face of white supremacy that denies the full humanity of our siblings in Christ, I can only proclaim with Paul that there is no distinction between Jew or Greek, that the Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call upon him. God does not favor one skin color or skin tone over another. There is no distinction in God's eyes. We are all beloved children. What can I say about these things? I must say that I am complicit and that my hands are not clean. I've never, never carried a torch or burned a cross or wore a hood, but I am a participant in the same systems that these white supremacists strive to maintain. My parents were never denied a home loan because of their race. My grandparents were never told which water fountain they were allowed to drink from. My great-grandparents were never held as property. My ancestors were not carried across an ocean in chains. Every part of my life and my heritage has benefited on the account of the color of my skin. And I'd say that's sinful on my part. None of us can control what family we were born into. And none of us can choose the color of our skin. But those of us who are white 
nonetheless benefit from white supremacy. And so those of us who are white are presented with a choice. Do we maintain white supremacy or work to break it down? There's no neutral position, no in-between here. Either we believe all people are created in the image of God, equal in dignity, or we don't. We must confess that we are in bondage to sin and we cannot free ourselves. And pray for God's mercy and grace to bring us out of our sin. Like Friday night, a group of fellow Lutheran pastors put out a call for someone to help write a litany. A prayer for use in worship today. And through Pastor Chien and our University of Washington campus pastor Elizabeth Rawlings, as well as many others who are awakened across the miles to participate in this writing and this litany. And I'd like to ask you to pray with me this morning. So the next slide. And the responses are in the bowl of the line. Gracious and loving God. In the beginning, you created humanity and declared us very good. We were made in Africa and came out of Egypt. Our beginnings, all of our beginnings, were rooted in dark skin. We are all siblings. We are all related. We are all your children. We are all siblings. We are all We know that we 
are in bondage to sin and we cannot free ourselves. We are captive to the sin of white supremacy, which values some lives more than others. We which believe some skin tones are more perfect than others, which commits violence against those who are different. We confess our complicity in this sin and we humbly repent. We ask for the strength to face our sin, to dismantle it, and to be made anew. We trust in your compassion and rely on your mercy, O God, praying that you will give us your wisdom and guide us in your way of peace, that you will renew us as you renew all of creation and humanity in accordance with your will. We ask this, we pray this as your children, all siblings, all related. 